So first off, thank you all for being here tonight. I know that um, it's late and it's cold. Uh, it's probably being here is not particularly high on your list of priorities. I certainly do appreciate you taking the time uh, tonight to be with uh, me here to have this discussion on uh, what we're calling the experience of things. Um, <clears throat> in my mind, this is going to be uh, a great year uh, for designers across the board, uh, and here's why. Uh, never before have we seen so much uh, emphasis being put on UX. Never before have we seen so many uh, technological innovations in the realm of things, uh, of the Internet of Things. Um, who, uh, just a quick show of hands, who here is familiar with the term Internet of Things? Okay. And uh, of those folks, who, who is, feels like you've got a good grasp of what IO, Internet of Things means, IoT means? Okay. Excellent, so that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good sample. Um, so uh, the, what we're going to do and how we're going to structure this conversation, again, hopefully it will be an interactive dialogue. Please feel free to jump in and interrupt me at any point. Uh, but <clears throat> prior to getting into the, the guts of the conversation, uh, just a, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so again, my name, Juicer Glee. It's, uh, when you have a name like Juicer Glee, you can either run and hide from it or you can embrace it. Uh, so clearly I've chosen to do the latter. Uh, very, very easy to find. I've joked that I'm the easiest man to find on the Internet, quite frankly. Uh, so... Please feel free to uh, jump out and connect with me by uh, any of the media channels that you see above. Uh, pictured also is my family. The reason that I'm picturing my family is because my wife happens to be here tonight. Today is her, her birthday. Uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I had this talk scheduled at the end of last year. I had to reschedule uh, with Judy because I had uh, several meetings that came up towards the end. Uh, she rescheduled for the 13th. I completely lost track of the of dates and didn't realize that it was my wife's birthday. Did not want to reschedule again. So thank you, Shannon, for graciously allowing us to have this conversation tonight. Uh, this, I, we, we call that our living the dream picture for, for obvious reasons. <coughs> uh, the other family member that we have that's not pictured, our rescue dog, Darla, half Great Pyrenees, uh, half Golden Retriever, all fur. <coughs> Bubble weeds in our house right now. Uh, so I was actually born in Seoul, South Korea. Came to Chicago uh, at the age of 10 months and have been around this area pretty much ever since. Uh, so uh, Korean culture is still very near and dear to me. Here's what I think of when I think of Korean culture. Unfortunately, these days, this is what people think of when they think of Korean culture. Uh, he's, got, he's got a lot better moves than I do, quite frankly. <coughs> I am a graduate of Northwestern University up in Evanston, Illinois. I graduated in 1994. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, that's the, the rock. The part of the tradition is painting it. Uh, there I studied uh, art theory and practice in political science with a, a famous Chicago artist by the name of Ed Paschke. Unfortunately, he passed away about three years ago. Uh, Ed Paschke was a, was a, a really uh, interesting guy, very, very committed to uh, studying what were called subcultures back then uh, before he developed a signature style that you can see there today, but certainly was very influential in my life. <clears throat> These days, uh, as, uh, as Brian mentioned, I work for a company called Jetty. We are part of the Catch Up Group, 20,000 people worldwide. Uh, I am responsible for uh, a good portion of those. Uh, and we are a technology services company that does everything from uh, you know, mobile application development to uh, big data exercises. Uh, I am responsible for a crew across the nation. Uh, there are some of the good looking folks that. Uh, that are part of our practice, and uh, we're extremely proud of and very, very happy with uh, the level of talent that we have uh, in, as part of that organization. Um, so uh, what, is the, what is the crux of this conversation? I think in the end, right now, uh, we have got a, a big group of people. A lot of you guys uh, deal with design, deal with usability, deal with uh, visual design. And the, the simple fact of the matter is right now, in this day and age, it's really great to be a designer. Uh, you've got uh, a lot of tools at your disposal, uh, but also outside of that, you have a lot of uh, a lot of respect in the industries like technology that typically uh, would not uh, would, that where uh, usability kind of goes ebbs and flows as far as importance goes. I think a good example of and, and Adam, I, I put that in there before I talk to you. So, <laughs> but but a good example of the uh, the level of seriousness uh, that we are seeing right now as far as experience and investments and experience. Uh, IBM in April this of uh, 2014 announced that they're investing $100 million 
in building uh, interactive experience labs across around the globe. Uh, this is the actual experience lab that they're building in New York City, uh, but a significant investment by a very, very large organization. You're seeing this across the board with a lot of different companies, a lot of different organizations, a lot of acquisitions and things of that nature. So, so people are taking uh, experience design very, very, very seriously. <coughs> and, and why? Uh, I think the, the reasons are fairly obvious to the group sitting here in this room. Um, so uh, massive amounts of channels of engagement uh, that did previously did not exist. So social media. Uh, with the Facebooks, the Instagrams, Twitters, LinkedIn, uh, across the board, all kinds of ways to connect people that uh, previously did not exist. And then uh, certainly mobility has been a, a massive driver of, uh, of this investment and experience. Uh, so you've got the Google Android, uh, uh, the Google Play Store, which uh, had a million apps and 50 billion downloads as of July 2013. Uh, the iTunes Store, uh, as of June 2014, 75 billion app downloads and 1.2 million apps, and a projection of 2017 of having 268 billion downloads, $77 billion of revenue being generated from mobility alone. So um, in the context of $77 billion, $100 million actually kind of looks pretty good, uh, a, a, a good investment. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> also why... Why is, design, uh, why is this design very, very relevant today? Just like to share with you a very quick video. Uh, we're running off of this little tiny Bluetooth speaker, so hopefully you guys can, can hear it. But uh, we're going to give it a shot because I can't get connected to the speaker system here. So let's see how it goes. scientific minds on this. Get India on the phone. We transport the United States to a safer planet. I say we give this alien a green card and make him proud to be an American. Sir, it's in dire times like this when I stop and ask myself, what would Oprah do? Hang it all. What's the point? It's a disaster. Stop! Oh, no, 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 no. That button launches all of our nuclear missiles. Well, then which button gets me a latte? Uh, that would be the other one, sir. What idiot designed this thing? <laughs> um, Monsters vs. Aliens, one of my kids' yeah. favorite movies. But, <laughs> um, real story, uh, about a month ago, we had a new elevator system installed in our office building. Uh, the, 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 we had four base of elevators. Classic elevator system worked just fine. New elevator system was put in. So of the four elevators, uh, two digital displays were placed between the ends. And there was one emergency button in a standard form placed right in the middle. Uh, when people were walked into the office for that, that first day, everybody walked up and tried to push that immediate that button until they saw the sign that said, if for emergency use only, do not push. And everyone would instantly stop, kind of look around, and try to figure out exactly how to get on the elevator and get it up. Uh, it got so bad that actually the office management brought down people to train people how to use the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what I've said to many people is if you have to train someone how to use an elevator, you failed. <laughs> Um, so, with that, uh, clearly uh, UX is uh, still uh, a very, very important. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is, is walk through a, a brief history of uh, three very, very significant uh, technology forces uh, that are really, really driving a lot of pressure and a lot of pressure on all of you guys to evolve today. Uh, starting with <coughs> a picture of a cartoon from 1906 in a magazine called Punch, uh, where uh, the first mobile devices are actually uh, drawn. Uh, the woman that you see here actually has a mobile telegraph. Uh, the man here had a mobile telegraph as well. And if you, if you look at the caption, actually what they says is that uh, the woman is receiving an, uh, an amatory message, and the man, uh, the, the clearly angry and disconcerted man, is checking on the racetrack results. <laughs> Uh, so in 1906, they foresaw Tinder and they foresaw you know, online gambling. <laughs> the the first uh, the first major uh, the first major development in computing was uh, came about in 1941, and like a lot of technology was driven by military usage. Uh, so during World War II, uh, a guy by the name of Alan Turing. <coughs> developed uh, two computers, the Zoo Z3 and the Bond Military Computer, uh, in this case to decrypt 
uh, German codes that were being used to communicate uh, during the during World War II. Uh, that was a very very uh, it was a very very compelling story so much that uh, it was recently made into a movie that you may have seen or seen trailers for called The Imitation Game, just recently released, featuring a guy by the name of Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, the reason that I call that out is because he's got the only he's the only guy in the world who has a name that I would not trade him for. <laughs> <laughs> In 1946, the Bell MTS mobile phone was used on a zero-G network. So for those of you who are familiar with 3G and 4G networks, there actually was a zero-G network, the original cell phone network. Uh, this was in 1946. This was the phone. It weighed uh, over 80 pounds. Uh, the battery of life was worse than an iPhone 5, but um, still, in principle, a mobile phone existed. Then in uh, 1960, the EC PDT-1 uh, computer was released. It's a precursor to a mini computer. So Alan Turing had this monstrous thing with all of these wires and gadgets and gizmos popping out. 1960, you're starting to see a shrinkage of the form factor of that machine. Uh, the PDT-1 was a, some, a semblance of that form factor. It cost the equivalent of a million dollars in today's, uh, in today's times. Uh, MIT was one of the first universities to actually invest in buying one of these. And the first thing that they did when they bought it was develop a video game. So you put the MIT invests a million dollars into uh, a computer, and uh, two propeller heads go, and the first thing they do is make a video game out of it. Uh, so in this case, the video game was called Space Force, still pretty, uh, still pretty popular in, in lore. Uh, but the, uh, the premise here was, was actually a little bit... Uh, was, was actually pretty exciting uh, because the reality was you had this input device and you were able to translate it to direct actions on the screen. That was the first time that someone was able to take that input and basically make it, make it uh, real and live on a, on a display. <clears throat> In 1965, two gentlemen by the name of Lawrence Roberts and Thomas Merrill connected a TX2 computer in Massachusetts to a Q32 computer in California. Why was that significant? Because that was the first instance of a wide area connect network ever created, which effectively is today's internet. Uh, so they took two computers that were on opposite sides of the, of the coasts and were able to exchange data. The, the principles that they used in, in order to establish a connection are still in use today. Uh, what you see here is uh, what that network looked like as of September 1971. Uh, and it's a bit fuzzy, but as you can see, a, a lot of the activity that was being driven for the connectivity was by universities and colleges. So this was something that uh, the world of academia was very, very uh, interested in uh, continuing to, uh, to drive, including the University of Illinois, which I'm sure everyone here is aware of was, was very, very instrumental in that. <clears throat> in 1968, Apollo 8 launched the first manned mission to space. Uh, why was this somewhat significant? Because uh, the central command for a uh, unit for that particular uh, spaceship was a two-digit key entry and an associated command button that you would push in order to execute. So the lives of our astronauts that were flying out in outer space were predicated on a user paradigm that we use every day when we are programming a microwave. In 1973, Motorola demoed the first cell phone. Some of you may find the shape familiar. That's uh, foreshadowing. Uh, but they demoed it. It was not commercially available. In 1974, Xerox released uh, the Alto computer, which contained the first mouse. And uh, not many of you may know this, but most mice uh, early on had three buttons. They all had three buttons. It was only later that two buttons were decided that, that they were enough. Uh, this was significant because the input mechanisms to this point had all been keyboards, had all been uh, keystrokes, etc. In 1975 through 1981, uh, four guys by the name of Gates, Allen, Wozniak, and Jobs really, really blew the doors off of home computing. Uh, so they created what uh, a market for uh, for home computers and PCs uh, that uh, that still, uh, quite frankly, exists today. In 1981, the Osborne, what, what released, uh, the Osborne 1 was released as the world's first portable computer. This, this is a portable computer, and the reason that I like this picture here is because this is the screen that you were yeah. typing on, uh, which is probably about the same size as the, 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 as the devices that you all have in your pockets. Um, <clears throat> Call the portable computer how portable it was. 
subjects he debated, but that was the first guy. Uh, prior to going on to the next uh, piece of the discussion, what I'd like to do is uh, take, a, take a real, real quick jump back into modern day and talk a little bit about the release of the original iPad. So a lot of us will remember uh, when the iPad was released, a very, very significant event. Here's how it was marketed. Be the charming type Take off your gloves And show what they hide I'll let you try If you close your eyes I'll have an answer for your eyes There goes my love There goes my love There goes my love So a, multifunctional device that was capable of doing all kinds of things and change, transforming and changing your life. The first one ever. Here's a commercial that's a little bit older. Yeah, this one's going to be hard to hear because the volume's low. But effectively, this is a commercial for uh, the Commodore 64, yeah. which shows all of the ways in which you can use the device. Uh, all of the, the fantastic things, spreadsheets, database, typewriter, keyboards, smart peripherals, etc. This is literally from 19, from 1970s. The Commodore 64 was released in 1982 and is still to this day the best selling single model computer in all of history. The Guinness Book of World Records put sales at between 10 million and 17 million units. In 1983, the Dynatac 8000 became the first commercially available cell phone made very famous and by Michael Douglas's iconic moment in Wall Street where he's showing how fancy he is with his big giant cell phone. In 1992, the first SMS text message was sent to a mobile phone and the first smartphone was demoed. Uh, does anyone know what the first SMS text message ever sent was? relevant to right about now, but it was Merry Christmas. <clears throat> by two, uh, by two uh, researchers in the UK. In 1995, the Federal Networking Council uh, released a resolution that effectively gave birth to what we know as the internet today. Uh, so in all the years, uh, uh, in all the years between uh, the first connection in 1965, Lawrence Roberts and Thomas Merrill, uh, to 1995, lots and lots of stuff was going on. People had competing formats, a lot of discussion back and forth, military use, academic use. In the end, they decided, listen, if we're really going to make this thing blow up, we all got to get behind something. Uh, this resolution effectively created that and also created what we, all, what we eventually know as the dot-com boom. <clears throat> and also gave birth to some of the first websites that we've ever seen. This is the original Amazon.com. Uh, now, the reason that I'm showing this particular image, because first off, it's not very pretty, uh, but it's all conceptual. Uh, when when Amazon.com first, was first released, it was viewed as revolutionary for us. Uh, because prior to Amazon.com going up, in order for you to get a book, you had to put on your coat and your shoes, you have to get in your car, you have to drive to a store, you have to browse shelves, you have to talk to salespeople, pick it up, bring it back home. This was a way where you could actually just in the comfort of your own home, hop on your computer, buy a book, have it delivered to your door, revolutionary. The experience was outstanding for us, even though the website was clearly hideous for its, uh, by, by modern standards. Then in uh, 2003, the BlackBerry released their GSM 6210, a very iconic device. Uh, Apple uh, blew the doors off in 2007 with the iPhone, as we're all aware. It's that the design of the phone is, has stood up remarkably well uh, by, uh, by modern standards. And then in 2008, HTC released the first Android, and, uh, and the rest is history. So what does that mean for us uh, all here in this room today? Uh, and why did I choose to kind of walk through all of this history of uh, a bunch of propeller heads putting together funky devices? Uh, and the reasons are, are this. Uh, I think, uh, although I've shown you the chronology uh, kind of combined between computing and the internet and mobile devices, only recently have all three of those converged inside of the smartphone first, 
and now inside of smart devices via the Internet of Things. And one of the, uh, one of the fantastic quotes that I love is, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. Uh, so we build these fantastic devices, and suddenly all of our behaviors change accordingly. You guys as experienced designers are ones that shape that, that shape that behavior. Whether you give someone a, an alert or a buzz on their phone, or whether you choose to uh, give, them a, give them a ding or a message, whatever the case may be, that's all part of shaping how we interact with technology. And some of the challenges that we have. Um, for those of you who remember uh, the internet, the, the, birth, the nascent internet, um, remember things like web safe colors. You have to use specific color palettes to be able to support multiple devices. It seems ludicrous now. No one, no one talks about it anymore. Uh, but back then it was, well, I need to make sure that I use web so it doesn't show up all pixelated and nasty on someone's computer. Um, certainly not an issue anymore. No one talks about it. Um, uh, all the mobile devices, tablets, uh, PCs, uh, basically we've, we've, we're so past, far past that conversation it never even comes up anymore. Uh, multiple input mechanisms. So there's not only a keyboard and a mouse, there's, uh, there's touch, there's pinch and zoom, there's the styluses, there's all kinds of ways in which we can interact with our, uh, with our technology and with our screens. The, there's also the challenge of uh, going with the, the ebb and flow of consumer tastes in, in screens. So um, I personally, and if you have an iPhone 6S, you know, more power to you, I personally think it's, it's, it's huge. It looks like putting a, a, an iPad up to your phone. <laughs> well, you're, you're a big guy, so you can get away with it. <laughs> the, uh, the important thing to note here is that the original iPhone, all the way from the original iPhone to the iPhone 4S, the phone screen size was designed so that you could hold it with one hand. So you could reach all areas of your device with a stretch, and there were very little areas that you could not reach. With the iPhone success, as you design interfaces, you have to take into account that with one hand, I cannot reach this area, and I can't reach this area. And that, that continues to ebb and flow. Sometimes we love big screens, sometimes we love small screens, and it just it, it goes, it ebbs and flows with the years. Uh, there's also the, the rapid pace uh, at which new technology is released, new mobile devices are released. So um, the, uh, improved sensors. We have sensors now that allow us to track all of, our, uh, all of our health, track our pulse rate, track our calories burned. Uh, we have improved cameras that allow us to finally uh, get away from this ridiculous process of keying in codes off of iTunes cards picked up at Starbucks. And now all I have to do is scan it with a camera because the precision has been increased and gotten better with my new device. Who hasn't done that, by the way? Because I mentioned that to my wife, and she's like, you can do that? <laughs> okay. And then, of course, there's, there's new inputs, um, new ways. Of, so we talked a little bit about uh, different ways that you can interact with a machine while you are touching the screen. Now there are voice inputs. Um, there's Siri, there's Google Now, there's Windows Cortana. Who here, uh, so let me ask a very quick question. Who here has a, has, let's start with who has an iPhone? Okay, so that's all fast. Let's, let's stick with that. Um, and, and who, and of you iPhone users, who played with Siri like nonstop when it first was released? And who actually uses Siri now, today? You, I, you, I know better. <laughs> Excellent. And one of the things that uh, technology provides also is voice input, as I mentioned, uh, and it can even do so in, in a whimsical managed manner. Cortana, sing me a song. I can sing this one. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. <laughs> So, uh, new ways that we can interact with our technology. Uh, and then, of course, there is uh, the whole concept of second screens. Does anyone here uh, use second screen apps when they're watching TV? And how do you find the experience? Just a quick. Well, I like it because it, is, uh, it gives me more options. Yeah. That's really why I use it. Yes. 
So it's the, the whole concept of being able to take an experience and enhance it using an entirely separate device uh, and orchestrating that entire dialogue across the two. Uh, another real, real challenge for interaction designers to have to embrace. Well, also part of that is because TD manufacturers are lagging behind, yes. you know, in terms of the, connect, the ability to connect services. That's right. So uh, we'll see what happens there. But it's interesting to watch people with tablets interact with their TVs through the tablet. It's a great point. It's, it's intriguing. It's a great point. <coughs> yes, please. I'm not much of a gamer, but why did the Wii U with that same principle not really pick up? The Wii U? Yeah, it has like a screen on the controller and a screen on the TV, but no one's going to care. So my, my take on that is that gaming is a different market. Uh, and your gamer, uh, your typical gamer uh, at this point is going to naturally gravitate either towards the Xbox One or PS4 because of two reasons. Uh, one is the, uh, the graphics, uh, and the second one is due to the gamer, uh, the gamer ecosystem. Uh, so the Wii U itself, although it had, the, uh, it had the second screen concept, it's the games and the ecosystem that kind of you know, kneecapped the Wii U. Right now, you don't have a Halo type of game, or you don't have a uh, you know Call of Duty type game that can that uh, like that the PS4 has that can really match that experience. <coughs> Any other uh, questions or comments? Excellent. <clears throat> so we talked about second screens, and they're little screens. So I have a little screen on my on my wrist right now. But uh, again, this is not a self-contained device. This is a device that has to communicate with a cell phone. And as we design the experience of me using this watch, it has to be orchestrated across two devices. So it's a real, real challenge for us to figure out how am I going to take uh, real estate that is this big, where I am restricted to taps and swipes and little mini poles. I have no keyboard. I have a little bit of voice input. How am I going to take all these tools, and how am I going to be able to orchestrate a really pleasant experience for the user that is using it? Well, also, I would say wearables is, a, is still a, a bleeding technology in the sense that the behaviors aren't there. Because people are talking about, what would I use a wearable? So I, I, I think, and we still call it, what I find very funny is that we tend to call things by what we know. So we call it a watch. Yes. So it's not just a watch. That's right. We call this a smartphone. But it's wait, I think I use this for a phone maybe 3% of the time. Sure. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, your metaphors point. aren't catching up. We don't have metaphors for these new things. And I think wearables is a perfect example of that. That's, that's absolutely right. And of the other 97%, I'm assuming you're spending about uh, 90 of that playing Candy Crush or something like Game that? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But uh, I can tell you uh, that, uh, you know, I, I have to buy these types of things because I have to understand how it's impacting my behavior. It has been very effective in a couple of instances. Uh, if you're driving, uh, when I'm driving and my wife sends me a text message, all I have to do is tap to respond. I don't have to take my eyes off the road and take a look down. Uh, also, um, sometimes when I have my phone in my pocket, I don't feel it vibrate or I don't hear the ding. Right. Uh, and it's very, very good about just giving you a little gentleness. You never miss the buzz on your wrist and I'll always tell you exactly where you are. Well, but what I find interesting uh, about this is we've been trapped for 40 years in a metaphor. It's called a wind. Windows, icon, mouse, pointer. We don't think about it now because it's been around like ether. But the, the metaphors for everything you're talking about is still very much in those metaphors. So for example, gesture is, is, is a form of that. Yep. It's just expressed in a different way. So, for example, Siri uh, in the new iOS it, it has a hands-free function, which means I, I should just be able to talk to it. Uh, yes. I go, hey, Siri. And Siri will say what you want, and you just tell it, like, call this or text that or do whatever. The problem for, from a safety perspective is you actually have, they have a tether to a physical power device right. to talk to, which I find ridiculous in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I think this notion of Star Trek, you know, where we just sort of suspended belief because we were sci-fi geeks, and where you just essentially interact, it was a pervasive computing environment, you just talk to things. That's right. There were no dials, knobs, steam gauges, those type of things yes. that, you, that you fiddled with. Yes. 
uh, I think you know that's going to be the interesting part where the interface is the environment. It's not an in-your-face screen. The environment essentially is your palette to interact with information. That, that's right. And, and I think one of the, the, the key things that you're hitting on uh, is this. I, uh, there's a lots of debate in uh, academic circles around you know, technology and how, how we interact with it. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that technology should recede completely into the background. That it shouldn't even be, it shouldn't even be buzzing you. Or if it is buzzing you, it's doing it because uh, of an emergency purpose. That, that our interactions become so minimal that they, and, and our behavior modified so much that, uh, that it's really, really, it's not a question of creating a beautiful <coughs> interface for me to interact with. It's a question of living. I just go about my day on a daily basis, and technology happens to be a part of it that I that I run into every now and then. But it, it's it's completely unnoticeable to me. Well, I, I think it's getting there uh, with the open source movement, and also with the open data movement. I think now you're having developers creating things that never were imagined because they have access to the data, and so they can create their own solutions sure. essentially. And yeah. I think that's 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 moving toward that because you have greater visibility over things you never had visibility sure. for. Yep, absolutely. So, but I still think you're right. You know, you still have to carry these things. That's right. And we talked about little tiny screens, and certainly we also have great big things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how we interact with digital walls. Has anyone here designed an interface for a digital wall? Just out of curiosity. Where you are now orchestrating uh, an entire experience for people who can wave hands and arms and move side to side, that becomes an entirely different, uh, uh, entirely different nothing. That, that was the promise of the Microsoft Surface platform. Right. That's they wanted to get big. That's right. With uh, their their walls to to sort of interact with data through gesture. Yes. Yeah. So we talked a, a lot about. We talk a lot about our interaction with screens, uh, but but what about today? What about now? Um, and why are we here having this conversation? Uh, how we interact with screens is obviously very important. That's the, the vast majority of our interactions, quite frankly. But uh, with the proliferation of the Internet of Things, uh, what we're starting to see is that our interactions with technology are not strictly screen-based and not strictly based on mobile phones. Now we are interacting with, quite frankly, everyday objects. And one of the uh, really great quotes by an MIT guy, David Rose, uh, that really captures the essence of IoT. In an interconnected instrument in an intelligent world, everyday objects become enchanted. Uh, so this whole concept of enchanted objects, I think, is one that it really, really captures the essence of, of IoT. Yeah. I'm going to take a, a regular everyday cup or a regular everyday toothbrush, and I'm going to imbue it with intelligence with technology intelligence, and suddenly it becomes uh, enchanted. Uh, and why? what are some of the driving forces behind that? Well, clearly there's ubiquitous internet access, um, Google floating balloons around the world to connect all of us uh, by internet access, uh, with the internet access. Also, um, lots of rapid pace, uh, lots of rapid development on uh, batteries, uh, battery technology that helps us to push to uh, corners of this world that we never thought possible. <clears throat> And some examples of uh, smart devices, smart objects. You know, again, a toothbrush, a smart toothbrush that can track how much or how long you're you're brushing, so that when you go to your dentist and he yells at you and says you're not brushing your teeth enough, or you're not flossing enough, you can say, No, look here. See, I, I have a track right here. Uh, a smart hanger system. So you take a regular everyday hanger, you view it with some intelligence. Suddenly, I've got the, I've got a system that can manage all my inventory for me as a as a clothing store owner. Uh, so. Uh, very, very, very sophisticated devices that are now being enabled by this interconnected world. That's the smart fill in the blank. Take an everyday object and fill in the blank. And of course, uh, IoT is not limited to just these dumb objects. Uh, we've also got tremendously sophisticated objects. We've got smart cars that are capable of detecting weather patterns, traffic patterns. Uh, we've got smart homes that are able to uh, tell you, uh, figure out when to turn the temperature up and when to turn the temperature down. And they're only getting smarter. But you also have a reverse trend, which is the steampunk movement. Yes. Which is 
you know, taking in and trying to put analog back into That's right. digital uh, in order for there to be more of a tactile, experiential, you know, type of experience. So it's, it's sort of interesting how the subcultures have taken what we knew in trying to recontextualize it. Absolutely. But still getting the benefits of digital That's right. technology. Yep. Uh, and, and how connected are we? Uh, I've got a nice little video to share with you here. It kind of captures it. Dude, the Google car was in our cul-de-sac. Check this out. Google House View Beta? Yeah, okay. Oh. 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 Sensitive, sensitive to course language. I apologize. I cannot edit that out. It's just, it's just too good. <laughs> so we've got, we've got the, 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 key, the key premise here. We have all these devices. They're smart. They're collecting all kinds of data about us. Uh, but these are, this is about us, about our surroundings. Uh, there is also, there is a gap there as far as how we learn to understand the person. Uh, fortunately, for people who are in this realm. <clears throat> We are more more willing than we are more willing than we should be to fill that gap ourselves. We are we uh, there is a cultural shift occurring. I think Pete Cashmore, the CEO of Mashable, captured it the best. Privacy is dead, and social media holds smoking gun. Uh, so <clears throat> I would I would venture to say that the vast majority of people in this room are very active in social media. You're active on Facebook, you're active on Instagram, you're active on uh, Twitter, whatever the case may be, uh, LinkedIn certainly, and that. You share a lot of information about yourself, where you are, who you're with. You take pictures of your food. These are this is all types of information that we willingly give that provide a complete picture of us that is augmented by what our machines understand about us as well. And uh, what that uh, the challenge that that introduces is how how do I craft an experience when I know that much about somebody? Um, I think uh, for those of you who have seen the movie Minority Report, it's coming out again in pilot by Fox, but here was one vision of what that future would look like. So, so as is often the case, um, I can pretty confident to say that Hollywood pretty much got this flat wrong. I don't know if there's any person in this room who would appreciate an experience where you are walking through a room and constantly being aggressively advertised to, no matter how relevant those were to you. Uh, so as experienced designers, you've really got uh, a tough task. You've got to figure out who you're going to be uh, with all of this information. Uh, am I going to be creepy? Uh, am I going to be a carnival barker like we just saw, or or am I going to be a concierge? Uh, and I think the the key uh, for all of us is that we would appreciate much more appreciate a concierge type experience than we were either the former. And how do we tailor these uh, concierge like uh, moments? Uh, one of the things that uh, one of the, uh, the catchphrases is a, is a mobile moment. A mobile moment is a point in time and space when someone pulls out a mobile device to get what he or she wants immediately and in context. That is the, the world that we live in today. That is the on-demand consumer behaviors that we continue to exhibit. Uh, we, are, we are more impatient now than we've ever been as a society, without question. And the reason is because we feel like mobile moments should be enabled with all the information that we, that we give, with all of our technological prowess, that we should be able to tailor these experiences. Well, I, I, I sort of think it's a it's a slippery slope because part of it is what you want, 
really comes directly from your neural network. And then part of it is based on your historical patterns, what the system thinks you want. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how those two things interconnect and what influences the other because they can be different or they can be very much the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the question now with IoT coming into play is: it, is it really is it really just mobile? Is it just mobile moments? Uh, so Uber is a company that uh, that got just about everything right except for their PR. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, a great app. Uh, you pull out your phone whenever you need it. it. Tells you exactly what it tells you exactly when your driver is going to get there. Mm -hmm. That what a very pleasant, compelling experience for someone who typically had to call a taxi company and then cross your fingers that it would come on time. Um, these are a little bit difficult to see, but uh, Uber, despite its prowess, was also something where you needed to initiate that activity. You needed to say, I need a car. Technology is getting even more powerful. Um, the first time your phones told you that you needed to leave because tra for a meeting, your next appointment on your calendar because traffic was bad, you were like, wow, that's, that's a mobile moment. That's like a, ooh, thank you. Mm -hmm. But incredibly powerful um, technology that tells you that your flight's delayed or that, the, that your gate has changed. But these are very, very simple examples, but very, but uh, very, very poignant examples of, of how the experience is going from this massively orchestrated, very elegant thing to a very tiny little bit of information that is that is delivered just at just the right time. I think it's in a predictive. That's the big move. Is the predictive. That's right. The future forward type of stuff. That's right. And uh, when we talk about mobile moments and moments of service, what if you're not even using a mobile device? You're walking out your door, and your umbrella, because it's connected, lights up and tells you, it's going to rain today. You better take me. That's it. You walk up to your door. Your handle is lit up. You say, OK, I need to grab this, and you go. That's the power of IoT. <clears throat> And when we talk about uh, IoT and we talk about um, all of the information that we surrender and all the, the information that people have on us, uh, in, inherently we eventually circle back to uh, another conundrum that designers face. How do I balance this great experience with privacy and security? Information security certainly being top of mind for a lot of folks due to recent high profile cyber attacks across the board, including one that made a, a really bad movie very popular. <laughs> um, so let's take, for example, what we remember from the dot-com days, your classic registration form. Uh, back to the concept of contextualizing what we feel is a good experience. For, for us back then, it wasn't a big deal to go in and constantly fill out the same form with the same information over and over and over again, because you're like, wow, this is great. Because once I'm signed in, now I can, uh, whenever I log in, I'm going to get stuff that's personalized for me. That's, that's important for me, and wow, that's totally worth it. Uh, now when you have to fill out these forms, if you don't have uh, you know, Chrome that pre-fills the, the form for you, you like, oh, this is the, the worst thing in the world, and another form that I have to fill out. <clears throat> and you take that one step further, and technology takes one step further and says, okay, well, we're going to implement a uniform sign-in process for the entire internet. And you will be able to log in using one of these providers. And this is going to be a two-step process at the most. And you think, wow, that's great, until someone makes it a one-step process. And, and then you think the two-step process is, is broken. And that's the, the, that's the pace at which technology pushes the envelope, and that's the pace at which our expectations change, where we stop thinking about that something is great, and we start thinking that it's inconvenient. A uh, real example of uh, my wife with um, Spotify recently. Uh, so. Uh, sometimes she likes to uh, tweet as our dog uh, was logged in and sending uh, dog type tweets. Uh, tried to log into Spotify but was logged into our dog's Twitter account mm -hmm. and couldn't get it. Uh, so she was banging, banging away, banging away, trying to log in, and then poof, text message appeared on her phone and said, Looks like you're having trouble logging in. Use this temporary password and go. What a pleasant experience. Uh, classic, classic paradigm. I go in. I, I got to tap my I got a forgot password button. I go in uh, to my email. I wait for it to come in. I take that temporary password. I copy and paste it in. All of these things before it, was, it seemed great before, but now with that paradigm, completely shifts the mindset. It modifies what we feel is actually uh, a pleasant experience. Oh, 
the bed, just a quick question. You said two step to one step. Is there going to be a time when we don't need a LinkedIn profile in order to sign into something? When will we have our own profiles that are independent of any kind of other party? So, do, do you want to do? Do you want to answer that? Is that why you're? Well, no, I want to know your answer too. Okay, so here, here's what I here's what I'd say. The, the, ch the challenge with the internet has always been this, and why logins were even created. It's a stateless session, right? So if you log in or I log, if you hit a website and I hit a website, there's no way for that website to know who's who until you and I both log in. At which point it can start tracking. Uh, so <clears throat> the the reality is that until that problem is solved, there will always be some type of login mechanism that I need to initiate that, that facilitates that process. Now what we're eventually gonna go to, and there was a video that I wanted to put in here but I never got to, but for the security login, what you really want is Thor's hammer, right? Is what? Is Thor's hammer, okay? So Thor, uh, the god of thunder, um, nobody can pick up his hammer except for him. What? So he puts it on the ground, people come and they try to yank it up, but he just walks up, goes boop, picks it up and walks away. That, that is how security should go. That's how it should work. That simple. So it's, it's, it's uh, and the most promising technology that we have now is near, fre near frequency identification. Okay, so I think that tied in with some type of biometrics may be right. something that cracks the code, right. but we're not there yet. And will only governments have that ability to offer that? No. Like, no. So, or the opposite. No. Oh, yeah. you're, you're saying it now. I mean, uh, this is my phone. I get my IBM apps on it. So it's not compartmentalized, but uh, because uh, it has biometrics in it, the, the fingerprint recognition, which is built in the iOS, uh, it passes security for IDF because I'm the only one that can be able to stop it. It does it with the fingerprint recognition. Yes. I, I think what, what's happening is for now, Facebook is the default password. Uh, if you have a Facebook account, it doesn't, I, I have like 300 apps on my phone. And a lot of them to get your password to log in to Facebook. So they're using the, 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 the enormity of Facebook users, they're using that as your gateway. But that raises all sorts of issues because of the APIs and backdoors and security. Yeah. They're using that for completely different reasons. Not really to make our lives easier. Well, that's it. Let's say they do it easier, but I'm just saying a lot of people yeah. have it, so they're using that as, as, your, as your gateway. I mean, Microsoft uh, you know, tried to do it as well. Yeah about seven or eight years ago when yes. I tried to use it, yep. never took off. But I think I agree with you, this is a huge issue. It is. It is. So I think that the answer is not until we get that, the whole near-frequency biometric thing kind of married together, will that work? Uh, but the, the, the underlying, the building blocks of that type of technology are there, but we're still a few years away, in my judgment. And uh, to kind of illustrate the whole point of um, you know, experience versus privacy and security, uh, I think if, uh, for, for those of us who uh, remember the tragedy, that was 9-11. Um, uh, you know, I, I was a frequent business traveler and was on several flight, flights uh, after, the, uh, after that event. Uh, security lines were, were absolutely enormous. Uh, you, you could anticipate spending at least an hour to an hour and a half in the security line at any, any given point. Uh, because of the depth at which they went and they, they analyzed uh, you and the things that you were carrying. Uh, nobody at that point would even think about complaining. It wasn't about the experience then, it was about, it was about the security. That's what you cared about. But as time went on, and uh, you know, people remember the events, but it was, uh, you know, the, uh, the shock of it would eventually kind of start to wane. Uh, you ended up in a situation where uh, you know, people started to grumble a little bit again. Like, hey, this line is taking forever. Uh, well, you know, what the heck's taking so long? And, and that's the, again the, the context, uh, the, the cultural context of, of us as a society. What we feel, how we feel about security, how we feel about experience, what our what our priorities are. These are all things also that experience designers need to take into account. Right now, we care more about experience than we care about security. Quite frankly, we do. But if someone, if some, uh, and if some horrific cyber attack happens and Sony gets hacked, we kind of bat an eye and say, oops, that kind of sucked. And then we, we move on and we still focus on our own personal experiences. So until some type of cyber Armageddon happens, uh, the reality is you guys have the very, very challenging charter of orchestrating and creating these fantastic experiences with the constraints of uh, balancing the, uh, your, your privacy and security. 
among other things. So uh, <coughs> as, a, as a final uh, discussion point to kind of close here, uh, what I'd like to do is just um, express to you a, a great, a great quote, quote from a guy who's very familiar to all of us. Uh, creativity is just connecting things. Uh, never, before, uh, never before has that been more relevant than it is today. Uh, and I think <coughs> I would encourage you all uh, to continue to be uh, inspired, to be motivated, and to be uh, thrilled with the technology progress that we are making. Uh, I would also continue on to continue to drive that synergy between experience and technology that really, really helps us improve our lives. And, and I would can encourage you to do this uh, with an ear to the voice of a very, very demanding customer who may or may not in the end uh, uh, know exactly what they're willing to give you in order to get that experience. Thank you very much. <laughs> any, uh, any questions, comments? Really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for coming out here. Thank you.